Okay, so some of you may uh, be intimately involved with the IUCN and the Commission on Ecosystem Management, and other of you, others of you may be new to the organization. So I thought I would start in with describing what the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group is and the entities that we work within. So we are a uh, group focused on ecosystem restoration that operates within one of IUCN's commissions. And that commission is, as I said, the Commission on Ecosystem Management. IUCN is a very large organization that includes the secretariat and staff that manage programs, as well as the commissions that provide technical guidance to the organization. And then, of course, the membership. And so within the Commission on Ecosystem Management, there's a large number of operating groups, including thematic groups that bring together across, uh, individuals who work across biomes and geographic regions to focus on specific issues like ecosystem restoration in our case. There's other groups that work on particular biomes like forests and marine issues, as well as uh, groups that are intended to work um, for particular regions like the North American group. So that's just a little bit of background for those of you who may be new to IUCN. Our thematic group in particular has as its goal to provide technical guidance to all the different entities within IUCN. So that includes uh, the secretariat programs, as well as our commission and all the subgroups within our commission and other commissions and the members. In addition, we aim to provide technical guidance to the global community outside of IUCN in order to improve the practice of ecosystem restoration. We uh, promote activities and events particularly translating the science of restoration ecology into practice. And we have the opportunity to engage a network of volunteer experts. We have over 320 members from 72 countries. So we have, as a thematic group, a pretty broad reach. I neglected to introduce myself at the very beginning. My name's Kara Nelson. I'm a professor of restoration ecology at University of Montana, which is a university in the Western United States that has a particular focus on ecology, conservation biology, and restoration, um, and is in a location that is amazing for doing that. We're in one of the wildest places um, in North America, or at least in the lower 48 states of the United States. I have had the pleasure of working for the Society of Ecological Restoration for uh, about 15 years now, including serving as their chair and serving as an interim executive director of that organization. And my research is primarily in terrestrial ecosystems on uh, responses of vegetation to abiotic and biotic change, as well as the efficacy and effects of ecological restoration activities. And I've been working uh, only for a short period of time with the thematic group. I joined Brock uh, about three years ago in a leadership position with the group and have very much enjoyed working with him over that time period. Brock, do you wanna say just a little bit about yourself before I get into a, a very short presentation on thematic group activities? Sure, yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. You probably see my name on the emails all the time. That's me. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll go through some introductions a little bit later, but um, I'll just introduce myself and then uh, Kara do some, uh, some presentation, just a little short one. Um, my name is Mark Levins. Um, I've been with the CEM and IUCN for about 10 years now. I uh, worked on membership coordination in North American and Caribbean region and then moved over to uh, the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group as a co-lead uh, with Keith Bowers and now Kara. It's been wonderful working with her. Um, and then the leadership amongst all the other thematic groups. And um, my other hat is 
I'm a training coordinator for NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program uh, in Goddard uh, Space, Space Flight Center in Maryland, USA. Um, so that's me. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and I hope this will be a very fruitful discussion. Okay, so just a little bit on what the thematic group has been up to, just to spark, help spark conversation, too. So one of the things we work on is technical contributions and guidance to improve the practice, as I mentioned. And we've been really active in this area over the last couple of years, working with the Society for Ecological Restoration on international standards for the practice of ecological restoration. I'm really pleased to report that just this week, we have submitted the final version of the second edition, which will be published in Restoration Ecology as a special issue. So the full, you know, 170 page standards and principles as one special issue. And I believe it will be released in September. And we'll send a note about that when it's available. Secondly, we have another special issue we've been working on specifically related to forest landscape restoration, where there's been an amazing amount of activity over the last decade in amping up the amount of forest landscape restoration um, that's being accomplished, but a lack of principles and guidelines about how we can best achieve maximum ecosystem benefits with these initiatives. And so that's the subject of this forest special issue and we uh, have uh, been having contributions rolling in and expect to have it finalized um, in September as well. And then third, the thematic group has been very active in working with an initiative of the Commission on Ecosystem Management in creating another set of standards, this time for nature-based solutions. And so we participated in a review of the relationship between uh, nature-based solution principles and um, principles for a variety of other frameworks, including ecological restoration. And in comparing them, we're able to come up with some needed innovations as well as uh, to start to develop a set of standards nature-based solutions and those standards will be released for review and come to people in our thematic group um, I think within the next month okay in addition to the work on technical guidance we initiated this webinar series in January and rolled it out with a suite of topics for the year and the goal in the webinar series was to engage, have an opportunity to engage directly with the members of our thematic group, in addition to providing our members with a forum to share their work. So this was the experiment of this year to see whether this type of activity could benefit our members. And in my view, it's been really successful. We've had a stable set of webinars. We've had, well, I have the calendar events here. Hopefully many of you have participated in them. And we've posted the videos for each of these events. And when I say that I think it's been largely successful, I'm basing that on the fact that we have had good participation in the webinars, but also we've had a lot of hits and watches of the videos. And so I think that we are accomplishing reaching quite a broad set of people through this webinar series. Today is the first webinar in our new initiatives column. And so we left a couple of spaces within the webinar series to have discussions with members rather than to give a formal presentation. And the goal of this was to have a chance for people to get together and collaborate on something new or provide feedback on the, um, the workings of the thematic group so that we really could start to leverage our, our volunteers. So that's uh, the plan for today. Oh, sorry, I have one other, one other um, bit about what we've been doing and it dovetails into the plan for today. 
So I put this category of global guidance or trainings, and so we've been active in participating at major restoration events, including the Society for Ecological Restoration events. Um, their last conference was in Brazil, and we had a forum on forest landscape restoration. We'll be at the upcoming uh, event in September in Cape Town, South Africa, which is another global conference and we're having a one day forum prior to that conference with a theme similar to the one today, the UN decade and um, what is the action plan we need to make the most out of this decade. In addition, we'll be at the World Conservation Congress. We put in for a, uh, I'm forgetting the name, I think thematic stream is what they're called. They're sort of symposium-like, but with uh, participant um, engagement as a goal. And we'll hear back soon whether or not that's been accepted. If it is accepted, we want members of our thematic group to engage with us in planning that event. In addition, we are starting to move forward with plans to have a pavilion, which is a very large exhibit, multi-day exhibit at the World Conservation Congress. And this is in this is IUCN's big meeting. It's going to be in France in 2020 in June. And so um, we're starting to build on ideas for what we could do during the pavilion um, that would be uh, beyond your sort of normal exhibit, but maybe have opportunities to work with participants to accomplish some kinds of goals, products, et cetera. Okay, so with that as a background on both the thematic group, the webinar series, and what we plan to do today, wanted to throw it open to our participants. Um, we have a, a small group on the line today to introduce yourselves. Feel free to talk about your engagement with IUCN or your work in ecosystem restoration or what motivated you to be on the call today. And then we'll get into the discussion. All right. So my name is Stephen Elliott and I run a small research unit called the Forest Restoration Research Unit in Chiang Mai University in um, Northern Thailand. And I think we've been a member of IUCN for a number of years, so we haven't really taken much of an active role because we've been busy doing other things. So I'm coming up for retirement, so I'm uh, interested in becoming a little bit, I'll, I'll have more time to get involved in this sort of uh, work. Um, so, yeah, I'm here to listen and to, to find out what's going on and uh, to look for ways to contribute. Hi, this is Arlene. Would, would uh, you like to hear from me now? Sure. First of all, um, I'm so grateful for this webinar and all the work that you're doing. Secondly, I'm having some technical issues here. I'm trying to turn down volumes and unmute things. But um, I'm a, by profession, I'm an educator and an architect, and I've been involved with um, ecological restoration now for probably about 30 years. So um, I'm very interested to learn more about this and to bring this into the work I do. Most of the work I do is at the community scale, and I try to link in also with the regional scale. And um, I'm also a member of the Resilience Thematic Group. And one of my ideas is to find a way to collaborate with libraries and use libraries as a point of um, distribution, if you will, to share this information with communities globally. Um, I'm a member of the American Library Association, among other associations, and I'm also on the board of my local library. And within the American Library Association, I'm on a group called Sustainability Roundtable. So I see libraries as being one way that we can bring the practice of ecological restoration down to the community level. And thank you again. Yeah, great, thank you. Hi, everyone. 
Hi, I'm Obed. I'm from Mexico, from Cabada. Uh, I'm I'm biologist. I work in a government office, and in my work is establish establish politics in urban areas for restoration with with tree with native trees here in in Angel Recabada, Veracruz. Oh, great. Welcome. Thanks. I'm Lourdes Gonzalez Soria. I'm forest engineer. I work in ecological restoration and management for invas of invasive alien, alien species in protected areas uh, here in Paraguay. Oh, excellent. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. If you would like, at some point, you could just introduce a little bit more about what you do uh, just via the chat. Great. Well, thanks to all of you again for participating. We've got a pretty good uh, sweep of the globe here. Again, the goal now is to talk about opportunities for the thematic to be more strategic in engaging in the UN decade, or rather than saying more strategic, but to be strategic. So every four years, the IUCN entities create new work plans. Mm. We'll be creating a plan launching at the Conservation Congress. And over the last four years, uh, the work plan was really about improving the delivery of these large-scale initiatives in ecosystem restoration. And as I mentioned, most of what we did was involved in developing technical guidance um, to be utilized by these large-scale initiatives and the UN programs, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and within IUCN. So we have an opportunity to tap tackle a new set of objectives over this next four-year period. The UN did just announce that 2021 to 2030 will be the decade of ecosystem restoration. And there's a lot of talk about what the targets for this decade should be. So for instance, in the UN CBD's strategic plan for up to 2020, the target was 15% of degraded areas restored by 2020. And different countries and entities were making pledges towards that. In addition, the bond challenge many of you are aware of called for 150 million hectares of forest restoration by 2020 and double that amount by 3030. So now we have the UN decade, people are starting to revisit targets. But there's some issues too, because restoration within these global initiatives is used very loosely to refer to a broad set of restorative activities. Activities being done in agricultural settings are, of, are considered part of forest landscape restoration. So there's a continuum of activities, you know, a restorative continuum, if you will. And so here we have the opportunity with the decade to really promote highest aspirational ecological restoration where appropriate. So there's also issues with balancing the delivery of ecological and social benefits. Oftentimes when across a landscape, people are talking about restoration and restorative activities, the place the conversation starts is with ecosystem goods and services, which are an important part of restoration. But unless there's a balance between what's being taken from the system and the protections that are in place, the activities may in fact not be restorative. So those are two issues for me that I think the thematic group needs to engage in. 
Also, we've been asked, what should the new targets be? You know, should they be a different hectare amount, area-based targets? Should the targets be about the approach? You know, we should aim to change the way that uh, we engage with this management activity. So those are some issues that we could be discussing. We can start there. Um, I also am hoping to talk with all of you about these planned activities, as I mentioned, at the World Conservation Congress. If any of you are going, we would welcome your participation in at the events. But even if you're not going, um, we'd love to get your ideas for what would make an exciting ex uh, exhibition in the exhibit hall for three days of activities you know, thinking about something like libraries, exhibits, et cetera. Um, and then some of you may have additional topics that you want to bring up. So I know we already have experienced some challenges with people being able to access microphones. So that may limit ability to participate in a conversation. This is, as we mentioned at the front, a, a sort of an experiment. Um, that Brock and I are trying in terms of being able to discuss with members of the thematic group and others who are interested in our activities. But we'll see how it goes. We've got about a half an hour here to explore topics. So I'm just gonna throw it open. And I'm gonna unmute everybody and see how that works. So Great. and then Brock, will you monitor the chat and yep. um, speak for people who don't have microphones? Yeah, you betcha. Um, and uh, we, we did have uh, a couple uh, last minute invites here um, that were written in. So uh, JC uh, um, is having technical difficulties, but she, she, she um, works in project management in the US Department of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office in Golden, Colorado, and looking to shift to a little bit more restoration ecology, and would love to hear more. And then we also had, um, uh, Deepra John, um, PhD student from Banaras Hindu University in India, working in soil science and uh, agricultural chemistry. Um, but yeah, so that was the last little bit. I will monitor the chat. If you don't want to talk on your microphone, feel free to type. Um, but we can sort of open this up to anything anybody wants to bring up as far as these topics or, or others. Is anyone planning to attend? Oh, we've got Arlene raising her hand. Let me just ask, sorry, Arlene, to interrupt you. Um, is anyone planning to attend the World Conservation Congress? You could mention that as we go along. And Arlene, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I just wanted to chime in here. Um, first of all, I'm really grateful for this webinar series. Um, and I appreciate the um, the focus which um, is to take the best science and to find the, then how to convert that into best practices and so when I wear my hat as an architect I have to be able to talk with clients and with other architects and engineers and even actually also um, real estate people and land use people about the value of doing ecological restoration, even discussions about the use of locally adapted native plants becomes yeah. extremely difficult. So this notion of converting to practice and bringing those practices into all the various disciplines who engage with land management, land development, land management, even the monetization of how we manage our lands, all of those issues I think need to be brought to the fore as we enter into the decade of restoration. And do you plan yeah. on attending the con Congress in June? It's in France. It's in Marseille. I'm hoping to. Yes, I have it on my list, and I'm looking for cheap flights. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. And by the way, if I might suggest something, one yeah. idea might be for this group to go together to maybe rent an, uh, an Airbnb or maybe rent something where we could all stay together, and uh, it could be economical, and it could be a great way for us to get to know each other. Yeah, that is a fantastic suggest. That is such a good suggestion that if even if there were no other suggestions that came out of this session, I think it would be worthwhile. Yeah, 
That's a great idea. And we do plan to have some activities as well for members of the thematic group while, while we're there. Um, but I think coordinating on Airbnbs would really help. It's one of the challenges of having a volunteer network that's spread around the globe. Hmm. Great idea. Um, so if you're planning on going, and since your skill set, I would say, is um, in important areas that are maybe underrepresented in the sort of mainstream ecosystem restoration dialogue, it would be really interesting to hear from you about activities that could maybe bring in a broader audience to the exhibition. So basically, we're going to have an, an exhibit, which um, for those of you who haven't been to these uh, congresses, the exhibit halls at IUCN conferences are different from any other conference that I've been to. Normally, for both small and large conferences, pretty much wherever I've been around the world, um, there'll be a place to have some tables for groups to provide information on their activities. It's along those lines at the IUCN Congresses. However, the Congresses are usually 10,000 people, so the exhibit halls are huge. <laughs> In the exhibit halls, they have these mini exhibitions that include stages. Mm -hmm. with content yeah. and so there will be actually meetings being held there'll be social activities with food there'll be displays and we're starting to build the activities for the ecosystem restoration exhibit hall which we need to fundraise for but that's in progress and it occurred to me that we might be able to actually do some sort of stakeholder involved research during the exhibit, for instance, we might want to ask people a set of questions that we could then report back about activities that they're doing in ecosystem restoration or problems or other things like that. And so, Arlene, you're talking about um, landscape architects, which is a very important group to engage in ecosystem restoration and restorative activities. I don't think we've had enough interaction with that group. And may I, may I add, not just yeah. land architects, but land use planners, architects, engineers, um, the whole gamut. Yeah. And actually, I, I'm actually an architect, but I work with landscape architects. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Maybe others could uh, chime in and, and say whether you're as excited about that idea as I am. Mm -hmm. as envisioning something within our exhibit where we could maybe focus on that audience and invite them to attend or um, have some content about some innovative activities that are going on in that area. Oh, I see a hand went up from Stephen. There we go. Am I on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just thought that uh, we're doing a lot of work on the monitoring side of restoration mm. and uh, a, a visually very attractive thing is all this new technology that's coming along that's making the monitoring so easy these days, which is drones. Yeah. And if you have a few, if you have a few drones flying around this enormous hall with 10,000 people in it, um, assuming you don't sever a few digits <laughs> along the way, uh, right. it, it, it would certainly be something that would uh, draw people into, e even if you're not actually flying the drones, but you've, you've got the, the three-dimensional models, the structure from motion stuff going on that is becoming all uh, really so vital in forest landscape restoration monitoring uh, because, well, for example, uh, carbon monitoring. You know, the old technique is to go out with a tape measure and you measure, you measure the girth of the tree and then you, you uh, get hold of the latest allometric equations from the IPCC report and uh, you plug your data into that and you come up with some figure for carbon and then that's what you sell, you know, for red or for the carbon credits or whatever. 
So we're finding that um, and, and, and a, a team of people going up and down the mountain measuring the restored forest for carbon. You've got boots on the ground, you've got transportation, you've got lunches, you've got tape measures, and usually you have to pay an expert who's on, I don't know, $500 a day, these carbon cowboys that fly in and do this kind of work. Right. Uh, we're, we're finding that we go out with a drone and we fly it for 15 minutes and every, every single tree within visual range of the drone can be now measured. So yeah. the days of boots on the ground, the days of yeah. boots on the ground and tape measures flung around trees at girth of breast height is it, it pretty, much, pretty much over. There's some issues to iron out uh, with respect to the accuracy of the drone measurements, um, uh, particularly the, the, the ground data. You have to know where, if you can't see the bottom of the tree, you have to know where the ground is, obviously. And that comes from Google Earth, and it's not always accurate. So there are some issues like that. But we're finding that we can do this now with uh, about a 10%, 10 accuracy. But the good news is that the 10% is, is always the same amount and in the same direction. Mm. So what we do now is we measure a few trees that we can see the bottom of. And then, um, and then you, that gives you the error. Yeah. Uh, and then you just subtract that from all the other measurements and you're most likely to be much closer to the, to the final height. So monitoring is vital for all sorts of aspects of forest landscape restoration, whether it's um, carbon monitoring or counting yeah. the number of different tree species that you've got in the forest for the biodiversity targets uh, or, or, or finding seed seed trees in the forest that are in fruit so that you know where yeah. to go to collect your seeds all that kind of stuff it's becoming almost uh, we we teach this routinely to students now um yeah it's becoming almost uh, a, a situation where if you're if you're an ecologist and you don't have a drone in your pocket it's like it's like 30 years ago and not having a pocket calculator in your pocket <laughs> uh, it, right. it's almost reached that it, it's become very almost routine just in the past two or three years. So yeah, and I think awareness of this and it's a spectacular flying thing that you can have in the corner, you know. And uh, even if you thing. can't fly it, we could roll video. Um, and yeah, go, we have plenty of videos so of the pretty. models that we've built. Yeah. Uh, so we can, we can let you have those. Uh, uh, um, yeah. And then you have the machine that they're, they're, they're not even spectacular machine they're just the ordinary dji drones that you can buy in a yeah. supermarket yeah so, right, um, right. They're, they're, they're none of this homemade homemade drones anymore with wires coming out in all directions it's just the regular mavic the mavic and the the um the phantom uh so they're, they're pretty much the two drones that all all, all ecologists are using now yeah that's an excellent idea um, and I can see working sort of new technologies for monitoring into, into exhibit space would be really nice, and including LIDAR um, and, and all kinds of new technologies. That's right up Brock's alley, too. And I think, yeah. Stephen, the way you just presented that with this vision of like a drone flying around, you know, the exhibit hall, and I'm imagining spying on different exhibits <laughs> and <laughs> projecting that. Oh, okay, good. we've got Marina. What the competition are up to. <laughs> we've got Marina, and then I have something I wanted to mention, and Arlene, I think, also wanted to get in. So I'm going to read Marina's. She says, number one, that she plans to go to the Congress. And secondly, I suggest to consider to present experience on ecosystem restoration and bottlenecks to put in practice restoration activities in America, for example. Maybe it could consider how we operate different methodologies, techniques, and also different innovative financing to take account and put in reality in this challenge. I think that's a really nice summary of sort of what we hope to do over the course of the three or four days of the Congress. And you've listed out a lot of really important areas. 
And since you plan to go to the Congress, I'll put you on the spot. And in particular, I didn't see your introduction, Marina. Apologies, I can't remember it. Am I remembering that? Um, not sure where you are in your career. So this is maybe for you, maybe not, but for others on the call. We are having a particular focus on young professionals at the Congress. That's a very important area for IUCN is to engage young professionals. So it's not people who are mid or senior career who are driving the agenda, but that our agenda is infused with people who are early career and bringing a fresh set of eyes and perspectives. And towards that end, in the session that we've proposed, we have, and I don't know if it will be accepted. So this is not the exhibit, the pavilion in the exhibit hall, but rather um, in, a, in a proposed session, a conference session, we have proposed to have all the facilitators be young professionals. And so I'm wondering if any of you who fall in that category, early career, including being students, who think you're gonna come to the conference, please let us know and um, let us know if you might be interested in serving as a facilitator because we're trying to put together a group of eight to 12 young professionals who would facilitate a table of participants, 10 to 12 participants, talking about a particular topic related to uh, improving the practice of ecological restoration in the UN decade. Yeah, just to jump in there, um, I did see Marina introduced herself uh, earlier. She's a professor. Um, oh. Federico Villarreal University um, and researcher, and um, but that could also be the young professionals. I think they say 35 and under. Um, and then Mauro uh, Fernandez Capari is an undergrad student uh, in Buenos Aires at my Monides University. So, oh, yeah. So, Marina, potentially you might have students in this category, undergraduate or graduate students who um, might have an interest in attending the Congress. I know it's very expensive to go to these kinds of events, especially um, in the location it's in, in June. However, oftentimes there's funding available to bring young professionals in that isn't available to others. And so um, for anyone who's listening who is considering going, especially in young professional category, or um, who engages with early career scientists or practitioners, let me know if they're interested and the thematic group can help provide um, uh, kind of a list of opportunities to apply. To. Yeah, and she said that she does have students uh, along those lines. And as we get closer, we'll try to communicate any of these opportunities as they come across our radar as well. Yeah. Um, and Marina also um, to be at the Congress. If you're interested, it would be great to have your perspectives on what we're planning for the topics to be discussed. The session was proposed as a knowledge cafe with very brief introductory presentations and then breakout groups. So uh, anyone on this call, if you're interested in continuing an engagement in um, the organization of this particular session and what we talk about, um, and we do plan to use the session to develop some work streams for the thematic group. Please let me know and we'll, we'll keep you on the list. Okay, I think we're at Arlene who had another comment. Yeah, hi. Um, okay, so I'm coming back to our shared screen. Um, a couple of thoughts for you. One is okay. that, um, Stephen, you were talking about mapping and drones. And 
there, and I, I, by coincidence, and just because you know we all have these shared interests, and it's very multidisciplinary. I'm also very interested in GIS. So among other things, I went to the Esri World Congress in San Diego. Oh yeah. Yeah, in June. And long story, sh yeah, long story short, I met the guy who's the um, apparently, and I don't recall his precise title, but he's in charge of marketing, if you will, to the um, IUCN. So, in mm -hmm. terms of mapping, one idea might be, and I've already reached out to him um, because I'm also on the IUCN Resilience Thematic Group. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It would be to bring him into our conversations also in terms of how we can engage with um, remote sensing, drone gathered data, and so forth. So the idea yeah. to connect our group with the Esri folk, if you would like. Yeah, that'd be a great partner. <laughs> okay, so that's idea number one. Um, idea number two would be that um, our group connect also with Mike Jones and Dorian Fugueres, who are in the Resilience Thematic Group, who also are talking about similar ideas about the Congress in Marseille. Yeah, so we, that is an excellent idea, and it's something I'm pleased to report that we do do. So um, the leadership of the different CM groups gets together in order to coordinate activities. And I'm also a member of that um, oh, great. So group. You're already so, doing, I'm sorry. Yeah, already yeah. but that is a great idea. We decided to um, go with the pavilion focus specifically on ecosystem restoration rather than a broader pavilion for CEM on, or nature-based solutions. Okay. So the excitement about the UN decade, et cetera. Yeah. But I think now that you've raised this, it would be a good idea to specifically reach out to the other thematic groups to see whether they would like to have some time within this pavilion in the exhibit hall um, to focus on their activities. Like we could have peppered through the three or four day program an hour for each of the different CEM thematic groups to highlight their work on restoration. Yes, and then, I have, and then I have two more yeah. ideas, if I may. Um, yeah. The third idea is I'm online right now on another window, um, and I'm seeing that um, there are Airbnbs available. Um, it probably would be an entire villa. And so the dates that I'm searching right now would be Tuesday the 9th, um, through Tuesday the 23rd and the reason for the Tuesdays is typically in my experience Tuesdays and Wednesdays tend to be the cheaper flight dates so oh yeah somebody wanted to fly in maybe on the 9th or the 10th um, and also get over jet lag because the Congress starts on the 11th yeah um, first but I actually went to the YN conference and there were also activities on the day after the Congress yeah right I'm looking at the period 9 to 23 June, and yeah. I for 16 plus um, sleeping spots. Yeah. And what I found were, and I still haven't gone through this obviously, but in general, the range that I spotted would be um, six to t eight bedrooms, um, multiple bathrooms, obviously, an entire villa, and the range would be 450 to 850 dollars a day. So if we were to split that. 15 ways, maybe 20 ways, yeah. um, and maybe also invite, open up this to maybe the Resilience Thematic Group. Um, I'm guessing we could get one villa for something yeah. in that range. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Hey, I just want to jump in here real quick. I want to give two new guests that okay. joined us a chance to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Harry Oaks and Joe Ferris. Not to put you on the spot, but I see that you jumped on. Uh, Harry, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, Harry Oates with ICF. We're a, I work for a consulting firm in Sacramento, California, doing habitat restoration work. And apologies for jumping in late. I was um, in some other meetings this morning and couldn't break away from them. But we understand. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Joe, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? You can type it or you can. Uh, Unmute yourself if, if you like. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, my name is Joe Ferris. I'm based in Scotland with a, um, environmental, well, my own environmental consultancy, and we do uh, 
conservation and restoration work, uh, small scale sort of things, but i um, been doing this for about 35 years. So uh, just um, been involved with the CEM for a number of years as well. Just have been a bit quiet in the background just because I've been very busy and haven't been able to contribute much, but I'm hoping to in the future. Well, we all do with whatever bandwidth we have, and thanks for introducing yourself. <laughs> I mean, you know, we try, we all have great intentions, and we fit in time when, when time allows, so uh, thank you for joining today. I just want to ask real quick, has anybody else submitted a proposal for a session? They were due on the 17th of July. Did anybody else submit for a session? No. Or you okay. can put it in the chat too. Yeah, or put in the chat. Um, I just be, I was just curious how many people. Uh, yeah. The ones. They were like uh, TED Talk styles. There was a campus style where it's sort of like a training, and then there was the thematic streams that Kara was talking about that we submitted for the. Rest yeah. Of so I want to jump back in. Uh, people feel feel free to answer. Put in the the chat. Um, I want to jump back in though to this pavilion, this big exhibit hall space that we intend to have. One of the goals and maybe the most important goal is to facilitate networking among IUCN entities, the commissions, the secretariat, and member groups. And one idea that I had is to have specific times for speed presentations by member organizations. So any IUCN member organization that works in restoration to discuss what they're doing. So what I'm envisioning is depending on how many people we can get to enroll, or sorry, to sign up, um, would be between a one and a five minute presentation on you know, what your group does, specific to restoration challenges, opportunities, and interest in networking. And in that way, we would get a fuller picture because there's so much restoration going on within IUCN. Our thematic group's goal is to provide technical guidance. People will call me from different parts of IUCN or email and I'll think, wow, I had no idea this was going on and it's a pretty big initiative. Mm -hmm. So just opportunity for people to meet each other and having some kind of a social. Um, so if you're thinking about going um, to, the Congress, I hear there's people uh, who just introduced themselves who work with uh, um, types of organizations. There's going to be a place for all small NGOs up to large universities within this idea of the pavilion setting. Don't have too much more time here. Let's, we've just got four more minutes. For folks who haven't had a chance, you've been kind of sitting on a comment and yeah, you want to bring it out in the chat or you think you're burning to put into the conversation? I can add something. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, the 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 comment on uh, innovative finance. This is the big yeah. topic now. So in the yeah. in the um, in the table round table discussion group not 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 really pavilion material because it's not very visual but certainly in the round table discussion group this business of of yeah. pinning down how you bring in private sector money yeah is, is a huge issue and, and 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 it's just floating out there nobody really seems to be grappling with it every time i go to a big congress and there's, yeah. a, there's nearly always a panel of a financial experts that get up on the stage and they, 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 yeah. they're talking about how important it is to involve the private sector. And I have a, a, like a standard question that I ask these panels. You know, I have $10 million to invest in biodiversity conservation in an FLR yeah. project. Where do I put my money? And nobody yeah. has been able to answer that. Uh, there's um, there's the various green bonds and things, but when you look into what the green bonds are investing in, uh, well, one of them was uh, the last one that was suggested was green rubber, and uh, this lady was on the stage waxing lyrical about green rubber, 
to a ballroom full of conservationists at the last ATBC meeting. And I thought, you know, well, how brave for a start to talk about rubber, the leading driver, one of the leading drivers of tropical deforestation to a hall of conservationists and actually suggest people should be putting their money into it. But uh, there seems to be nothing out there. So, so coming up with, with, with something that actually works, uh, yeah. People talk about ecotourism. You know, ecotourism is like the only thing where you can directly monetize biodiversity. Uh, but but not every forest can be an ecotourist forest because you flood the market. Th this whole issue, I, I really get nowhere with it. I bring it up at every meeting. Mm. Yeah. Know, somebody comes along, they've got money to invest. Today, where, where would you advise them to put it? And there's really nothing on the market, um, apart right. from a few green bonds of dubious, dubious value to, 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 to biodiversity. And um, it, it, either we're serious about bringing the private sector into FLR, or we say biodiversity is a, a, a public benefit and it should be funded by government funds with without a profit motive um so this is a huge huge issue and if, yeah. you, could, if you could attract some really key speakers who are that there, there are schemes out there all very experimental if you could attract some of those guys to yeah. come along and make some short presentations about what is available yeah. and then see see really what's working and what's not what what can be replicated and that, that's the key because there's yeah. so many pilot pilot projects on the financing side right what is so, really working so finance is absolutely yeah finance that's a great idea and as you were speaking i was uh thinking of something i didn't mention at the start of this discussion is that we need to populate our webinar series for next year. Populate out. Sorry, I missed that. The, uh, we need to populate the webinar series, decide oh. on topics for the webinar series, this series for next year. We're planning to do what we did last year, which is to invite speakers in November and December for all of 2020, so that in January we're ready with a calendar for the next year. And I think many of the topics raised, including uh, new technologies, I wouldn't even call them emerging anymore, but for um, restoration, for monitoring restoration, someone giving an overview of how you get into it, costs, whatnot for member groups, innovative finances, uh, planners, if you like. architecture, yeah. and. Um, the idea for the webinar series is an opportunity for the experts in our network, all of you, to make presentations. So we've heard some great ideas. If anyone on this call is interested in hosting a webinar next year, giving a presentation, and again, the videos get posted so you reach the participants during the session, but also it's posted on the IUCN CEM ERTG website, and we've been seeing quite a bit of traffic on those. So you can put in the chat, or Brock, can you put in the chat our email contacts? I will. I will. Um, and since we're right on the hour here, I wanted to put a plug in for uh, through the end of the year. So the September session, which is just before the Society for Ecological Restoration Conference, is going to be an update on what's going on in Latin America. And, uh, it's being given by Consuelo Bonfil, who is chair of SIACRE, which is the Latin American and Caribbean Society for Ecological Restoration. And Marina, you probably know this, but their next conference is going to be in Lima, Peru. And uh, so Consuelo will be with us in September. In October, we also have a regional update from West Africa. Mm -hmm. 
In November, we're talking, we are, our theme is technical guidance, and we're talking about native plant materials and issues in seed sourcing. So this is where the fields of ecology, evolutionary biology, and landscape ecology hit directly into ecological restoration. So um, we'll be talking, excuse me? The, the seeds one, what, what month was the seeds one? Uh, that's November. And hopefully you guys can share my screen. I'm sorry, I can see my screen, which has oh, yeah, the yeah. list up. Yeah, uh, so that's being given by um, Tom Kay, who uh, works with um, the Institute for Applied Ecology in the US and is also on the board of the Society for Ecological Restoration. And then in December, we'll have another discussion. And um, the idea there will be to, um, we'll send in advance, will be to discuss the four-year work plan for the thematic group and get some additional ideas. So with that, I think we're at time and we need to close out. Uh, this has been really useful for me. And I've enjoyed getting to know um, those of you who are out there as part of our volunteer expert network just a little bit. Please feel free to contact Brock or me if you want to have an offline discussion. We can schedule an individual time to talk if you're interested in engaging more with the thematic group. We are a large group of volunteers, however, there's a limited number of people who are actively engaging and our goal in having this kind of a discussion format and webinar is to bring you all into the fold and so as much time and energy as you want to invest in the thematic group it what be it in helping with technical guidance or in global initiatives or um, stakeholder outreach um, please you know let us know and we're happy to uh, increase the activities that you're doing along with us. Yes. Any more, Brock? Uh, else? No. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if anybody's interested in uh, contacting us afterwards with uh, some ideas that um, you weren't able to fit into this hour, and honestly, we could have done this even longer. We should have booked more yeah. time something like this. Um, because you know we get excited and we think about great <laughs> ideas, um, but uh, yeah, please email us offline um, if anybody's interested in becoming you know a country coordinator for the CEM restoration group in in your country in your re CEM region. Feel free; it's basically a way to just sort of find the, the best minds in restoration and get them involved in the conversations. Um, you never know what will happen organically. We kind of self-organize, so. Um, if you're interested in serving a role like that, um, it won't ask too much of you. It's more like kind of, you know, working through your networks and finding good restoration ecologists out there. So contact me if you're interested in something like that. And um, when it comes to um, some sessions next year, you know, maybe because we only have 12 slots, um, maybe we can have one where we have multiple members that one hour time slot and would do like six, 10 minute you know, quick round table, uh, just kind of talk about the work in restoration um, around a certain theme. So I'm just kind of throwing ideas out there, but um, think about that too. We'd like to hear more from what you do and, and relay that out to the rest of the group. Great, thanks Brock. And as a reminder, the video will be posted from our discussion today at the same place you can access all the videos and we will send that to everyone who participated along with a link to a survey. Yep. So thanks, everyone. Hopefully we'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, thanks for setting it up. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it was fun for us, too. It was a little bit different than usual, and uh, it was nice to get to know everybody a little bit uh, more. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.